Christmas is about Jesus. It's about God and what God has given us. So since that night near Bethlehem, the message has been taught and preached all over the world. It's a message of good tidings, a message of great joy, a message of comfort, a message of peace. Somewhere among the commercialism, somewhere among the tinsel and the mistletoe and Christmas trees and flashing lights, the message of Christmas, folks, is alive and well. The story of one little baby boy born in a stable in Bethlehem of Judea, born to a poor mother, and Joseph the carpenter, seemingly unnoticed by the world at that time, until the angel appears to a group of shepherds on a nearby hill, bringing that first message, that first Christmas message to those shepherds. Bear with me, if you will. I'm not going to stand, ask you to stand to read this morning, but bear with, you, with me, if you will, while I read Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And the taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. Father, we thank you. For this Christmas season, we thank you, God, that this message is still alive and well. We thank you, God, for these that have made their way out this morning. And God, we know that many of us have been touched by trauma and drama and distress at this time of year. We ask you, God, that you would help us to look past all of these things. To help us to look into that little town, into that stable that night. God, help us to see that gift that you have given us. And help us, God, to focus not on what we have done and not on what we will do or can do for Christmas, but, God, help us to focus on what you have done for Christmas and be thankful for that, to give you glory and praise for the most perfect Christmas gift that anyone could ever ask for. God, we thank you this morning for Jesus, for salvation. We thank you for this Christmas message. Help us, God, as we hear the message that you have given me. Help us, God, to uh, focus in on the true Christmas message. And, Father, help us not to get lost in the commercialism of this world. We thank you and praise you for all you can and will do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was a time when the world was looking for a Savior. 400 years. The world had been... Silent as far, or God had been silent as far as the world was concerned. No message had come from a prophet. No message had been uh, uttered. No prophet had spoken concerning what God intended to do in this world. And then all of a sudden on a hill nearby Bethlehem, uh, uh, can you imagine what it was like for those shepherds? There were no street lights in that day. No, no cars going up and down the road lighting the hillside. The only light was in the sky, was stars and moon, very dark out there in that, uh, in that place. And all of a sudden, this great light begins to shine, and an angel of God begins to speak to these humble shepherds. Uh, it was a startling message we can see. You see, the shepherds were bedding down for the night. 
Maybe one was speaking of a beautiful little lamb that had been born that afternoon. Uh, they were no doubt laying around talking about how that they had kept the wolves at bay. And maybe uh, there was a wild animal that had come and st- taken one of their little ones. And the shepherd was in remorse about that. Uh, whatever shepherds talk about at uh, bedding down time, they were just having an ordinary day. And all of a sudden, a great light appears and shines around these men out on that hillside, this light uh, began to startle them or startle them and this voice no doubt startled them. They were startled then by the glory light. Look at verse 9 in Luke chapter 2. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. Men today are still startled by the light of the message of Christ. It stirs uh, the soul this morning. Whenever you go to a place where the word of God is being taught and being being preached, if there's one there who's not in fellowship with God, that light, uh, that light will startle that man or that woman. That light will begin to shine upon them, and for a, even a brief moment, they'll see themselves as God sees them in their sin. You see, the message of the cross, the message of Christmas, the message of Jesus still startles man today, and it ought to startle us. Amen. We need to be startled in this hour in which we live. Uh, This message came to these shepherds and it startled them. This light startled them. The glory of God startled them. Most churches are so dead today and wrapped up in their rituals and religion. They're wrapped up in all of their uh, pomp and circumstance that if the glory of God was to shine down on the congregation, it would scare them half to death. Oh, we need that old time fire once again in the house of God. We need the message of God and the message of the gospel uh, brought out that light needs to shine in our dark hearts. That light needs to shine in our dark homes today. The light needs to shine in our workplaces and in our our bedrooms and our living rooms. We need that light to shine and to lighten us and show us what God would have us to be. We need that today. That was a startling message. The Bible says over in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 4, Isaiah 6, 4, And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Oh, I believe if God can shake the house in Isaiah's day, I believe God can shake it today. I believe that we need some post-shaking of preaching today. We need the Spirit of God moving and us being yielded to that Spirit today. Well, I believe we can have the house of God filled with smoke, and I'm not talking talking about marbles and Winston. I believe the glory of God can fill the house of smoke or with smoke today. I believe if we'll get that faith that Brother Terry was talking about, if we'll leave that commercialism that Brother Rick mentioned this morning and just let God be God, we'll see the smoke in the house of God again. We need that in this hour. In verse 5 in Isaiah chapter 6, it then said, I, after this glory light shone, after God's presence was seen and felt in the house of God, then Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Do you know what's wrong with the world today? We've lost our vision of the King. We don't see Jesus as our King anymore. People are not afraid. That is, they're not afraid of sin. They're not afraid of the judgment of God that's still imminent and still coming upon mankind today. Why, what they do is they've included themselves or secluded themselves in their own little world, in their own little nutshell, and they believe that they can buy their way through or or be good their way through this world or or live a a life that's above reproach, and they think they escape the judgment of God. My friend, we need to see Jesus as King and Lord and Master in the house of God today we need to be startled once again some that comes to a church where the preacher rarely ever raises his voice or you don't hear a holy grunt uh, they're startled when they hear this but we need some startling things to take place in our lives today It'll get us uh, paying attention, uh, if you will. Startled by the glory light, but also startled by the godly love. Would you look at verse 10 in Luke chapter 2? And the Bible says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Oh, can you imagine how terrified these shepherds were when they saw that light? Just think about it. 
You see, there wasn't anything such as searchlights in that day. They weren't, a common, they weren't accustomed uh, to uh, uh, phenomena taking place on a regular basis. There was no way uh, that a certain light like that could be manufactured by man. It had to be uh, something of God. And so naturally, they were startled. No street lights, as I said, no city lights, only the moon and stars to light the night. And then suddenly this great big light, this extremely bright light illuminates their camp. But the message was not a booming thunder of terror, but it was the love of God brought down to man. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, I, I, I want to give you this message this morning and understand that when God speaks to us and we're startled, God is not intending to scare us to death. He's not intending to uh, drive us in terror, but he wants to show us that without him, without him in our lives, without him as our God, our souls are doomed to eternal damnation. God wants us to see that and that he wants us to understand that he's reaching out not with a hand of judgment. He's not trying uh, to uh, beat us over the head with a, a baseball bat, but he's reaching out in love and asking us, begging us, calling us to receive his love and mercy. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, And you... He hath quickened, or hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. Whenever a preacher booms out that message, it's not as he's looking out and saying to you, you're worse off than anybody else, or he's not trying to point his finger at you and judge you. Remember, we all had our conversation, our life lifestyle. All of us were lost and undone in sin. Oh, but thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift, Paul tells us over in Corinthians. Oh, thinking about what did we do when we were lost and undone in sin. We fulfilled the desires of the flesh, fulfilled these lustly, fleshly desires. That's what we were out after, but oh, after the Spirit of God moves in our lives, after we truly get born again, our desires change, our, do, our want-tos change. We begin to want to live for God and live for Jesus and preserve this good old Christmas message. That's what a good Christian wants to do. The love of God is startling and stunning, but thank God it's real. Amen. Amen. It's real. It's not only a startling message, but it was a sovereign message. Again, verse 10. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. You see, God has the ability this morning, the ability of sovereignty. That is, He is over all things. Uh, there is nothing that is not under the sovereignty of God. There are those, and I've seen them, and you have too, and uh, they, they call themselves self-made men. And they say they don't need God. They've got everything they need. They, they've, uh, they get up every morning, and they go to work, and they're self-made. They don't need God. But I want to remind you, if you're one of those people, if it were not for God, you wouldn't get up in the morning. God is over all things. A lot of people believe just because they don't believe there's a judgment, they believe they're going to bypass that thing. That doesn't change it. God is still God, and he's still going to judge. God is still the God of all creation. Not one man, boy, or girl, uh, not one uh, a woman is going to bypass God's judgment. You'll either come through Jesus Christ and be pardoned for your sin, or you'll stand before God and be judged for them. Amen. God's God, and He's sovereign. Our God is the awesome and mighty God this morning. He is the self-existent one. The name Jehovah means I don't need anybody else. Amen. That's what it means. Jehovah means I'm the self-existent one. You and I depend on other people uh, to, to get along. You say, I don't depend on other people. I beg your pardon. You do. What if the people didn't show up at the power company in the morning? Where would you be? You'd be in the dark. Amen. What if, the, what if the farmers quit farming? What if the, the butchers quit butchering? Amen. Amen. We do depend on other people. We need other people. Uh, we, we depend on other people for love and nurture. We depend on doctors, don't we? And, and, and medicine. We depend upon these things. God doesn't depend on any of us. He doesn't have to. He's the self-existent one. 
God was before you and I came. He was doing fine. Sometimes I wonder why he made us. He knew what we was going to be like. He knew how honorary we'd be, how rebellious we'd be, but God in his infinite mercy and love reached out and made us anyhow. Amen. And not only did he make us, he knew we were going to fall in sin. He knew that we were going to bring sin upon ourselves and death and destruction. And God knew that. He made us anyway. And then he said, I'll go and become a man and die for them so that they don't have to die. Folks, that's love. That's love. God has that ability. He's the sovereign God. He has the ability to reach out to every human being, every one of us, in grace and mercy and love. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. These words mean that he has all knowledge and he's uh, all powerful and he's omnipresent. There's nowhere God is not. He's everywhere. He has the ability to love and keep us. I thank him for that. No matter what our circumstance is this morning, God has the ability to love us and to keep us. Uh, Let me read to, to you from Psalm 139 this morning. Oh, Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. I have been at work and a message would be coming to me on a certain topic or subject. And I would think about this verse of scripture right here and and it would only be an idea at this point in my mind. It would only be an inkling of a message. Uh, But God knew my thoughts afar off. God knew what the finished result was going to be. That has always amazed me. God knows what I'm going to think before I think it. And not only me, but you too. Amen. Thou compassest my path and my lying down. Oh, if you're going through distress this morning, heartache, depression, listen, God is there. He compasses, that is, He embraces our path and our lying down. And He's he's acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid Thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. That's God, amen. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. But the night shineth as the day. The darkness and night are both alike unto thee. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. Think about what the psalmist just said here. Have you ever been in a cave? How many of y'all have ever been in a cave and and you put your hand in front of your face and you couldn't see it? You ever been like that? I have. Get down in them cave, up in uh, Kentucky, they got these coal mines up there. They're black anyway. But you can get back in there and, and cut off all the lights, and you can, you can put your hand right there, and you can't see it. There's no light whatsoever. And if, if I were to walk by, unless you made a noise, there was no way I could see you in that place. It's totally black. Amen? But you know what? God sees you just plain in there. He sees you just like you're embraced in light. There's nowhere you can go that my God can't see you and my God can't touch you and my God can't help you. There's nowhere God can go anywhere. Amen. I've often thought about this in our day day of space age exploration, uh, how that maybe an astronaut would be upon the moon. And you think about this. We think about getting saved in church and we think about getting saved uh, in in a Bible class or a vacation Bible school. But if if an an astronaut was up on the moon and he bowed in prayer there on the lunar landscape, God would hear him and save him up there. You don't have to be on earth to get saved. Amen. Amen. God knows where we are. I think about that old TV show, Lost in Space. If you could get lost in space or did get lost in space, you'd only be lost to man. God would know where you were. Amen. He's God. He's God. Oh, God has the ability of sovereignty. It's a sovereign message, the Christmas message. But not only that, he has the authority of sovereignty. Many today think and they act as if there's no God. People go from day to day. And they live their lives as if there's no God. 
They get up and they go about their life. They say their swear words and they go out and they do their, their thing and they live their life of debauchery and, and licentiousness. They do whatever they want to do, acting as if there's no God until some kind of tragedy strikes their home and then they want to bow on their knees and pray and ask God for deliverance. Now, God can, but I wouldn't think God would, not in every case. Now, I know that he has in times, but many think and act as if there is no God today. The Bible calls that person a fool. The Bible says in Psalm 14, 1 and Psalm 53, 1, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But there are those that pretend that they're not under God's authority. Listen to me this morning. You may have been one of them in your life. You pretended that you're not under God's authority, friend, you are. This is God's earth. Amen. It's God's earth. This is not only God's earth, but it's His universe. His creation, all that is, belongs to Him. He is the God of all things. And you and I are under God's authority, whether we like it or not. Christmas is a message, he says, to all people. The angel said this is a, a Savior that has come to all men, all people. God has provided a means of salvation to all people. You see, he's sovereign, and he can do that. Obama can only offer certain things to Americans. He cannot offer those things to those that live in Great Britain or those that live in Iraq and Iran. I sometimes wonder about those two countries, whether or not he can offer things there. But I know that he can only offer certain things to Americans because he is only over America. But God, friend, is over everything. And God has offered every man salvation today. It's for everybody. For everybody. God provides a means of salvation through his son for all people. If that method, friend, is refused, there is no other. There is no other. Notice what the, the, the angel said. He didn't say, in the original Greek, in the original Greek, this A, the letter A is not there. I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, we, we, we know that Jesus is the only Savior. He is the Savior. There is no other Mankind without Christ is under condemnation. The Bible tells us in Romans 14, verse 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account to, of himself to God. Did you hear that? It is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. That's your knee, friends. That's your knee. And every tongue shall confess to God. That's your tongue. Amen. That's mine. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. That's, that's God's word. You put it down. You heard this preacher say it on this here day, in this, in this time, that your tongue was going to confess to God and your knee was going to bow. Now, you may not do it in this lifetime, but when you do, you'll remember that I told you that you were going to. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Yes, yours, mine. Every knee, every tongue. I was in the jail preaching several years ago, and I remember telling the inmates I was preaching to, I said, fellas, reach down and touch your knee, and they did. You can do that if you want. That knee's going to bow one day. Amen. You can feel your tongue in your mouth. Leave whether you get it cut out or not. Amen. You can feel your tongue in your mouth. That tongue's going to confess to God. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. There is no exemptions. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Folks, we're going to stand before God one day. That's the message of Christmas. God says, I have provided a means of salvation to the world. It's not about buying Xboxes and, and, and Nintendo games. That's not what Christmas is about. It's not about new cars and motorcycles and, 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 and fur coats. That's not what Christmas is about. Christmas is about mankind is lost and God has went to all expenses that heaven could afford to provide you and me a Savior. That's Christmas. Man is under condemnation without Jesus. Finally, not only was it a sovereign message and a startling message, it was a salvation message. Look at verse 11 in Luke 2, and I'll be finished. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. It's a common salvation. The angel said it, for unto you is born. This message is for common Jewish shepherds. But not only just common Jewish shepherds, but to all shepherds. Not only all shepherds, but to all people. We read back there that this message was to all people. Amen. And so God has reached down and He chose to bring the message first of all to the lowly shepherds there on the hillside. He didn't go and announce it to some king in some palace somewhere so that He could charge a tax on the message. That's not what God did. He brought it down to common man. That means that everybody can partake of it. Amen. It's for everybody. It's a common message. Common message. This message is for all people. But my friend, it's a message not only to all people, but it's a message to you and a message to me. He's our Savior. He's our Savior. Each gift that we receive on Christmas in that true spirit of Christmas is a type of Christ, if you think about it. It's a personal and individual gift. When I go out and, and I'm able to buy my wife a, a gift, it's a gift that I chose just for her. Just to please her. Not to, not to impress other people or not to uh, uh, make other people jealous or zealous, but I give a gift from the heart to my wife and from my children. Or for my children, I give gifts because I want them to have these things. And each time that these gifts are received, I didn't say given, I said received. You see, how, how do we receive the gifts? That's what's important. God has sent His Son, hasn't He? That's, that's all that heaven could afford. Mankind has rejected that. They have spurned that gift. They have, they have snubbed their nose at a lowly carpenter's son, one born in Bethlehem. Uh, they, they said even, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Uh, listen to me. God sent his son and man rejected it. It's not about the giving. It's about the receiving. How have you received that gift? But oh, when you receive a gift in love, when you receive a gift in appreciation, understanding that the inv individual has given from the heart, you receive that gift in the spirit of Christ. I don't care if it's a stick of bubble gum, friends. If you receive it rightly, then you've received the way God wants you to receive. Just receiving it with appreciation and applying it knowing that it was given to you. Jesus Christ was given to each one of us individually. Amen. Each one of us. God says, I've got a gift for you. He looked down. He said, Robert, I've got a gift for you. Monroe, i got a gift for you. Milton, there's a gift for you. It's just for you. You say, but everybody else got some. He's brand new to each one of us. Amen. He's new every day. Thank God. Refreshed. Common salvation. The Bible tells us over in John chapter 1, verse 11. He came to his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That word sons literally translated as children. All to as many as received him gave, him, gave them the authority. The, the, they were uh, uh, given the authority to be or to call themselves a child of God. Think about that. Can anybody on earth give you such a gift? If you come in this morning and you're not a child of God, you've never been born again, is there anybody in this church that has the authority to call you a child of God when you're not? No. But because God is sovereign and has that authority to as many of us as receive Jesus Christ, He has given us the authority to call Him our Father. And God has that authority. He's given us a wonderful common salvation, but also... It's a complete salvation. Again, verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Now, in the English translation of the Bible, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the King James. There's not. But in the original text, this A, Savior, is literally the Savior. The Savior. Jews were not looking for some saviors. They were looking for a Savior. They weren't looking for some messiahs. They were looking for the messiah. Jesus is our savior. 
He's the only one. There is no other. The Bible's plain about that. Uh, the A, the letter A was added to help us in our uh, uh, reading of English. The translators, nothing wrong with it. Just want to make sure we understand Jesus is not a Savior. He's the Savior. There is no other. There is no other Savior. Acts 4.12. The Bible tells us that Acts 4.12 that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you're going to get saved, friends, you have to come to Jesus. You can't go your own way. God is not going to honor your way. He's going to honor His way. Amen. Amen. He's going to honor His way. He's made the plan. He's made the provision. You don't need to do anything. To try to earn salvation is, is an insult to God. He's saying, oh, you think you can do better than I did? We can't earn our salvation. It's a free gift. It's a free gift. Jesus is our Savior. All right, you say he's the Savior, but what kind of Savior? Well, he's the perfect Savior. Amen. One final verse of Scripture, then I'm going to ask Rick and the musicians to come get us a song. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7, verse 25. The Bible says, Wherefore, he, speaking of Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I want you to think about something for just a minute. Because Jesus lives forever, and because his blood is perfectly cleansing us day to day, you and I have perfect salvation. Amen? You can't improve on it. You can't improve your salvation. You can improve, and I can improve the way I live. I can draw closer to him. I can be in or out of fellowship with him, but I cannot improve upon my salvation. It's perfect. It's perfect. He's able to save us to the uttermost. Well, I don't know how far the uttermost is, but whatever it is, there ain't nothing that can beat it. It's the uttermost. Saved to the uttermost. Friends, this is the Christmas message. This is what Christmas is all about. It's about Jesus Christ coming to this earth. It's about, it's about coming not only to be a baby in a manger, not only to shepherds and Jews in Bethlehem of Judea, but to the world. The angel says, This is good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all men. For unto you, all men, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The Hebrews said he was Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. The Bible calls him Kurios, that's our Lord, our Master, Rabbi, Teacher, whatever you want to call him, he's your Savior. He's your Savior. That's what Christmas is. It's not about, Lynn said she went into Greensboro yesterday to pick up a few things and the traffic was ridiculous. And I understand people want to go out and buy gifts. I'm not knocking that. But the problem is, see, we've lost the point. The point has been lost. We try to outgive each other, if we're honest about it. Well, what'd you get? Well, here's what I did. Well, what'd you do? This is what I did. We try to outgive each other. Folks, really, you can't outgive God. He's done give the greatest gift. I think we need to get our minds back on plain things, the basic things, the main thing Jesus Christ. It's all about Him, it's not about us. It's what God has done for us, the Christmas message. It's a startling message. It's a sovereign message. But most of all, it's a saving message. You can celebrate Christmas until you turn into mistletoe, but if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, you'll die in your sins and burn in hell. Friend, don't go to hell. Life is hard enough. This world is miserable enough. You don't want to leave this earth and go into a devil's